We've been going through Acts here at Calvary, verse by verse. This is our third message. We've come as far as verse 9 to 14 today, and this message is entitled, The Ascension of Christ. So would you join me in just following along in your Bible? Let's read up from verse 8 just to get the context there. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me, said Jesus, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And when they returned to Jerusalem, for, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. We'll just pause there and pray. Lord, as we come into this time in your word, we thank you that you have given us a great mission Lord, that you have given us the overflowing power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we also look forward to that day when you will come back. And in the meantime, Lord, we ask that you would teach us today how to know your truth, how to stay focused on the calling and the mission you've given us. And would you fill us afresh with your spirit and with great hope in Jesus' name. Amen. So look again at verse 8. But you shall receive power. Power, Jesus said. Last week we touched on this and I just want to recap it a little bit. The word power in the original language, dunamis, it means dynamite, dynamo, dynamic. And the idea here is that the Holy Spirit is coming to empower us. It's the upon dynamic of our relationship with him, where he is, he's with us, drawing us to Christ. Then he comes in us at that time when we trust in him and he never leaves. He's always there but he also wants to come upon us to empower us. So don't try and do ministry without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And this becomes practical as we learn to surrender to him, to trust him, to believe in him for that source of power, not by might, not by our power, but by your spirit, Lord. And this power has been given to us, not just for our own personal benefit, but actually for a purpose. The power is there to become a witness. Look again at verse 8, and you shall be witnesses to me even to the end of the earth. And witnessing is not just something we do, it's something we are. The baptism of the Holy Spirit enables us to go from wimps to witnesses, to be true disciples of Christ, who are shining bright with our whole life, with the example of a transformed life and to be bold with our lips, declaring the good news when God opens a door and we get the opportunity to share it to uh, those who need to hear that message. So the purpose of the power is not just a feeling or just an experience, although there can definitely be those great emotions. One pastor told me one time, and I still love thinking about this little statement he made, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will, <laughs> uh, he will work in such a mighty way and you will know, you will get a sense of his presence. And uh, I just want you to know that this is something we can ask for, we can believe for. But sometimes we don't always feel it, but we have the word of God. And even when we don't feel his presence, we know as we say, Lord, you said in your word, you promised that you would fill me with your spirit. And so I'm asking you to overflow my life, not with my power, but with yours. And so Jesus said, you'll go into all the world and you'll make disciples of all nations. And this empowering helps us to shine bright before a lost world. It also helps us to build up other believers. Part of making disciples is not just making converts, but building up those who are saved. And so we need this power from the Holy Spirit, not to do this in our own strength, not to force this. Are we trying to force God's work? Are we trying to force love out of us and patience. No, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit overflowing. And this is what God wants to do as he works first in you, then he will work through you. And it's amazing 
to hear about God's heart here to empower us, that he, Jesus gives them this great mission. You're going to go to all the world, but then he, he, he takes the burden of achieving that off their shoulders and says, but first wait, and then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And it truly is incredible to think the same Holy Spirit who hovered over the waters in Genesis at the beginning of creation. The same Holy Spirit who raised Christ's body from the dead now lives inside of you, believer. There is no need to do this in our own power. He wants to come upon you. He wants to empower you. He wants to overflow you. Are you receiving that? Are you walking in that? And this starts with our own walk with the Lord. Before we do ministry, God working through us, it's got to be in us that God is changing us, transforming us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome the pull of sin as you keep relying on him. You can walk in the newness of life. Galatians 5 describes the life in the spirit. It says, those who walk in the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so you do not have to be dominated by the old nature or by the things of this world. You can rely on the Holy Spirit for everything that God has called you to do, starting with personal walk and obedience to the Lord. And so if we are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give us that, that fresh desire to be wholeheartedly surrendered to, to Jesus. A true empowering of the Spirit starts with that deep hunger in daily life for more of him. And a conviction about our own sin, a true heart to change and become like Christ. So this is not about just having an emotional experience or an exciting time at a service or an event and then walking away where there's no lasting change in our life. That's not the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit is that true, deep transformation from inside out. And the message on our lips will also be overflowing. It'll be a message not pointing people to us, but pointing people to Jesus Christ not pointing people to our particular church or our particular system of theology. No, we'll be witnesses to Jesus, verse 8 says. We'll be telling people about that, what Jesus has done for us. And so I want you to look again at verse 8 at the, the very end. It says, You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We didn't quite get that far last time, but here is the divine outline for the whole rest of the book of Acts right there in verse 8. We'll put it up on the screen. Chapter 1 to 7 is them going into Jerusalem with the gospel. Chapter 8 through 12, they spread out to Judea and Samaria. And then chapter 13 to the end, it's the, the beginning of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. And you can picture it like concentric circles going out. And yet, as I mentioned at the outset of this study, it's not complete yet. The mission is not complete. We're, we're in that Acts 29, Acts 30 stage where we now are part of that mission. We are, you could say Saskatchewan compared to Jerusalem. <laughs> I think we're the ends of the earth, right? Compared to the center there in Jerusalem, we are part of this fulfillment, but we have people to reach. You know, Pastor Chuck, when he started well, when God started Calvary Chapel through him, he saw a, a great revival happening in California. And you've, maybe you've seen the Jesus Revolution movie. There's a little uh, insight into what happened there. But in a sense, as the gospel took root there in that church and so many people were getting saved and going out and planting churches, in a sense, that became like a new center sending place for missions. It became like the new Jerusalem in the sense of the, the place for mission to go out, according to verse 8 here. And so then God started working around the world, and the mission went out. And one of our people in Canada got uh, on fire for the Lord, Pastor Glenn in Calgary, and he went down to visit, and Pastor Chuck gave him a few minutes of time to say, come on in, and then he quoted this verse. And he said, Pastor Glenn, you know, for us in California, Calgary is the ends of the earth. <laughs> and of course, you know, Americans, it's not that far, but for them, Canada is so far away. <laughs> but but, but it, it, the point is, look, it, it really works. It goes out. And then he said to Pastor Glenn, when you're in Calgary and, and just teaching God's word, 
pre preaching the gospel, you'll become like another Jerusalem and people will go out from you into uh, the, the surrounding regions in these kind of circles, just like this verse. And so here we are now in Regina and this Regina now becoming our sending hub and, and God sending out from us toward uh, Strasbourg and Boulier and people coming, connecting from the Davidson area and Radville and Weyburn and beyond and out by, out in, the, in every direction. But, but as we go, we get to go bring the gospel wherever we go and then out potentially further and further as the Lord would guide us and lead us. We are not meant to just be, oh, I got what I need. I got salvation and now I can just sit around and, and be happy. We're meant to say, Lord, here I am, send me. And as he sends you into your schools, into your workplaces, or perhaps he even moves some of us around, uh, he's sending us with the message and the hope of Jesus Christ. But let me just make a real simple application. Being a missionary, it's all of us. Being in ministry is all of us as believers. But it doesn't mean you have to travel long distances because we're already here at the ends of the earth. What it means is we have to start with our home. There was a famous pastor called Oswald J. Smith, and he once made this quote, and I really like this quote, the light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest at home. And so if you want to be an effective witness at work, that's where God's sending you. If you want to be an effective witness in school or in your, in your places of connection with people, make sure it starts at home first. Make sure you're living the life and caring for the people around you and being aware of the ministry that God has called you to in your home because the light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest at home. Now look at verse nine. Now, when they had spoken these things, so when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So after Jesus has been resurrected and shown himself for 40 days, he now gathers these 11 disciples and probably other disciples as well. And they gather together and he commands them back in verse four and five to wait in Jerusalem until they're baptized with the spirit. He gives them this great commission to go out and be witnesses. And then right after this, as he gives them this commandment to just wait for that power, the disciples watch him rise up and literally ascend and, f and go up off the planet <laughs> before their eyes. Like, wow, this is the ultimate mic drop moment. Like you say something and then boom. And, and here he goes, and they're just watching this. Now this event is called the Ascension of Christ. And these instructions in verse four to eight were so important that he says these words, it says in verse nine, when he had spoken these things, then he was lifted up. And slowly before their eyes, they look up and they look up and he's just going. And eventually into the clouds and into heaven. What a way to make a statement. <laughs> If you had something really important to say and you said it and then just lift it up like, wow, I don't think people would forget those words. And so Jesus says, I've got this mission for you, but I also want you to wait for the power. And then whew, off he goes. And when he had spoken these things, he lifts up and flies off the planet into heaven. Now, verse nine, look at it closely. While they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So this is telling us that this was not something that could be confused as to, did he really? No, no, they were watching steadfastly. At the end of the book of Luke in chapter 24, verse 51, we'll put it on the screen. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And so there you go, Jesus finishes his sayings and as he's praying for them, he's rising up and he's blessing them. And eventually he vanishes out of their sight. And he's received back into the presence and the glory of God. 
The doctrine of the ascension of Christ, it is littered throughout the rest of the New Testament as well. I'll show you one verse, 1 Timothy 3, 16. It says, and I'll read the whole verse, uh, but we'll put up the key part on the screen. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh. So if you ever talk to a Jehovah's Witness and they say, oh, is Jesus really God? Well, 1 Timothy says God was manifested in the flesh. That's Jesus. He was justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up in glory. That's the ascension of Christ. That Jesus, God in the flesh, he died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's alive and well today. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. Even the end of the gospel of Mark, it says, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, the Father. And so this is emphasized by this phrase in verse nine. Look again at your Bible there. A cloud received him out of their sight. Now, I don't know this 100%, but I think when you study through scripture and you see the weight of all the verses, that this was not just a regular cloud. That this was, in fact, the glory cloud of the visible presence of God. The Shekinah glory of God that appeared many times in a cloud. In the Old Testament, there he is in the book of Exodus saying he will appear to them in the cloud. And then God showed his glory to Moses in the cloud. And then the temple, when it was dedicated by Solomon, the glory of the Lord came down like a cloud and, and filled the temple. And this is actually seen in the New Testament at least two times I could think of when the angels came to the shepherds at Christmas. And it says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they started worshiping and praising and singing at the announcement of the Messiah, the glory of God. And then of course, the transfiguration of Christ. You remember that scene when, when Jesus is up on the mountain and some of the disciples are with him and, and God just opens up their eyes to see him in his glory. It says that the father spoke and as the father spoke and said, this is my beloved son, it says a bright cloud overshadowed them. The Shekinah glory of God, this cloud, the father indicating his glory and his pleasure toward his son, Jesus. And again here, I think in verse, in, in that first Timothy verse, when it says Jesus was received up in glory. So that tells us that the cloud was, was not just a regular cloud. Now, you, some of you guys love studying science and the weather and all of that. And there's all these different names for the clouds, the, the cumulus cloud or the nimbus cloud or the, uh, the wispy one. I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to remember their names, but there was, this was, I think this was different, that this was the glory of God. And just imagine how this would have felt to the disciples. Imagine you're one of those disciples there. And here's your savior and he's rising up into the glory. And they know at this point, he's not just gone around the corner and he's going to visit Sally down the road and he'll come back and visit us again tomorrow. He's not just popping over to a gas station to buy some gum. No, he's actually gone. Like he's gone, gone. Like this is a new era starting right now. We've seen him, he's ministered to us, he's taught us, he's, He's shown us his power. He's died on the cross. He's filled us with the Holy Spirit. Remember, he had already breathed on them and they'd received the Holy Spirit into them. And now at this point, they're, they're going, he's, he's, he's gone. He's gone, gone. And this is the start of a new time. John chapter 16 would have come to their mind when Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so now they're going to relate to God, to Jesus, through the personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, who now has come to live in them and will soon be coming upon them. And now they really understand that they should not expect to see Jesus reappear in a few hours or in a couple of days, but now they must do what he's told them to do. And if you look back at verse four, what did he tell them to do? To wait for the promise of the Father, which you've heard from me. And then verse five, that they'll be baptized with the Spirit. And verse eight, that the Spirit will come upon them. Now's the time to just simply wait for this empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we get onto that, here's another question that might come to your mind. So what's Jesus doing right now? 
<laughs> if he's alive and well, and he's in heaven, what is he doing? How would you answer that question? What is Jesus doing in heaven? Well, I can think of at least three things. Number one, he's praying for us. Hebrews chapter 7, 25, it says, Therefore, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. God, Jesus himself is praying for you to the Father right now, always praying, ever living to make intercession for you. And by the way, this tells us that Jesus is our high priest, that he is performing that ministry of representing us before the throne of the Father. And so you do not need a human priest to pray to, 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 to talk to God for you. Sometimes people uh, ask me for, the, for special prayers, and, and I'm just a pastor. I'm just a, a regular guy who's called to shepherd and care for the people and feed the people, but I'm not, I'm not a priest. And actually, the Bible describes what we would call the priesthood of all believers, that you, through Jesus Christ, have access to, to God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so through Jesus Christ, we all have special access to the throne. But Jesus is the high priest, not, not the guy up front at church. And that's why I tend to not try and dress in some special spiritual way different from everybody else wearing a big cross or a big robe or, or collar or something, because I'm just a regular person like you. We all have access to the throne of God. When you see a need, you can go through Jesus Christ and pray for that need. When you see a person who's hurting, you can pray for them through Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Christ, you're accepted at the throne. And Jesus is also praying as that intercessor, as that high priest. And so let me also encourage you when you're struggling and you think nobody cares about me, nobody's praying for me right now, I'm alone. No, Jesus Christ is interceding for you and he's looking after you. And here's another thing Jesus is doing right now. He's advocating for us. When we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then it goes on to say that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So when we're struggling, just turn to Jesus, say, Jesus, help me. And that's what he's doing right now. He's alive and well. And you say, is there another thing? Well, actually this next point is, is so big, I can't even really describe it, but Jesus is orchestrating the mission. He's working through the presence and power of his spirit. Remember how he said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, verse 20. How is he with us always? Through the spirit. And actually there's two places, one uh, in the Bible that describes the Holy Spirit with a special name. One of my favorite names for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit in us and with us is the spirit of Christ. It's Jesus here with us. As Ephesians says, Christ lives in your heart through faith. It's by the person of the Holy Spirit. And so you can look those up, Romans 8 and 1 Peter 1, describing the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. So what's Jesus doing? Oh, so much. He's alive and well. But he's also coming back. Look at verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, and so the language here is that they're looking for him. They're watching him. And it's almost like their eyes are straining in that original language, looking steadfastly. I don't know if you've ever released a helium balloon into the sky, maybe by accident. <laughs> and you're like, kids, don't look. <laughs> Daddy, my balloon. Yeah, there it goes. But there's this point as you watched it where I can see it, I can see it, I can see it. And then there's this nanosecond where you can see it and then you can't and it's just too far away that's what's happening in verse 10 and then it says behold two men stood by them in white apparel these are angels clothed in white just like at the empty tomb and it says here they're they're standing there in white apparel this is not a fashion update from luke this is telling us that they're angels he's not like White was really in that year. I mean, it was so good, just so clean and minimal. Oh, man. No, no, here what's happening is they're seeing angels. Why two of them? Well, the Old Testament says 
by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so two angels at the, throne, at the empty tomb, two angels at the ascension, and they're telling them what's happening. Look at verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The angels have two things to say. First of all, you guys, there's no point standing here gazing. He's gone. And there's a bit of an application there in our day. We're waiting for the Lord to return, but don't just stand around gazing. Get busy with the mission. There's nothing wrong with being eager for Jesus' return. Nothing wrong with that at all. We should be eager. We'll, we'll quote Philippians 3 at the end about eagerly waiting for his appearing. And, you know, uh, even the phrase of the church called the bride of Christ. Why are we called the bride of Christ? Well, the idea, the, the concept behind the, a bride is that she's eagerly waiting for that day. She's eagerly waiting for that groom. And we as the church are looking forward to Jesus' return. But that doesn't mean we sit around just gazing up and, and looking and waiting and doing nothing. God has given us a time to shine. He's given us a ministry and a mission, and we need to stay focused. So they say, why do you guys stand gazing up into heaven? And then they say, the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come. So their message is, he's coming back, guys. In his time, he's coming back. The, the, when no one knows the day or the hour, only the Father, but he's coming. And this is great assurance for the 11 and for us. This same Jesus is coming back. Now, that little phrase, this same Jesus, is actually really important. Because this is saying, and you might want to even circle it in your Bible, this same Jesus, the one you've touched, the one you've seen, he's coming back just as he left. Why is that so important? Because there's deception today where people say, oh, Jesus has already come back in a secretive way, in a spiritual way, in our hearts, in uh, some mysterious appearing somewhere in some secret enclave. And there's all these different uh, messages to say, don't wait for Jesus to bodily return. No, no, he will physically come back, the same Jesus. Don't be deceived by any spirit that claims to be Christ. This same Jesus is coming back just as he left. And it even says there, he will so come in like manner. And this tells us about his second coming, just a little tiny bit, that as he ascended up into heaven, into the sky, so too one day he will descend and put his feet back on the ground. Now, how do we know that? Where do we see that? Well, I'll read it to you. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3 and 4. It says, the Lord will go forth at the end of this uh, great tribulation time, and he will fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle, describing the battle of Armageddon. And this is when Jesus sets his feet on the ground. Verse four says, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. And it goes on to describe the Mount of Olives splitting in two and a big, large valley. And then rivers of wa living water will flow. And you can read Zechariah in your own time. It's a prophecy of the Messiah that after defeating the Antichrist, Jesus will put his feet on the Mount of Olives, and Zechariah goes on to describe how Jesus will finally bring peace to Jerusalem as he will be king over all the earth in that day. Wow. Where is he coming back? Same place, Mount of Olives. He's going to set his feet there, and then peace will come as he defeats evil. And the Bible even says in Jude, Behold, he comes with ten thousands of his saints. I believe we'll be coming back with him after that great tribulation from heaven, having been raptured before the judgment that comes from God upon the unbelieving world. Now, where will Jesus return to? Well, there's a specific place right there, the Mount of Olives, as it says in Zechariah, right across from the old city. Now look at verse 12, and we'll just go down to verse 14 today. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So where were they when this all began to happen? They were up on the Mount of Olives, specifically on the reverse side of the mountain near the town of Bethany. And now about in verse 12, it says, what do they do next? They go 
to Jerusalem, and it's just a short journey, about a kilometer or so. Why? Well, because Jesus told them to. And here they have, I mean, what are they going to do? Well, I guess we obey what he says. He says, wait in Jerusalem. Okay, let's go. And so they go to Jerusalem. This is not their home. Most of them are from Galilee. And they're just there because Jesus was there. Their home is north somewhere. But Jesus said, wait. Okay, I guess we'll wait. So they take it literally and they obey him literally. And they wait in Jerusalem, specifically in an upper room. By the way, here's an application. When Jesus tells you to do something, just do it. (laughs) I know it's really profound and deep and and intense here, but, you know, they need the power of the Holy Spirit to do the mission. Jesus said, wait. And so that's all they can do is is obey and wait. And if we want to be fully empowered for our mission and the ministry God has given us, it starts with obedience. Is there something in your life that you know you're not obeying the Lord? If there is, it will hinder your intimacy with God, it will dampen your faith, and it will quench the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so you need to repent of it. You need to take it seriously and make a decision to say, Lord, okay, I'm sorry for my disobedience and I'm going to choose to obey. And so, Lord, help me. And so remember, the Holy Spirit, he's your helper to help you do that. He's already in you, and, and when you surrender and give him control, he'll help you and empower you to obey. And then there'll be more of his work overflowing your life. Watch how the grace of God will flow in and through your life as you choose to obey. So simple. They obeyed in verse 12. Now look at verse 13 and 14. It tells us about the apostles, where they went, what they did, and who was with them. It says, when they entered, they went into an upper room, Where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they go to the upper room, probably a rented place in Jerusalem, where they had probably had that Passover meal with Christ the night before the cross. And they just kind of start meeting there and gathering there. And by the way, the next verse, we'll get to verse 15 next week, but it tells us how many there were. There was about 120 of them. So there you go. This is not just the 12 disciples. There's a big group of disciples, but still 120 is pretty small compared to reaching the world. It's kind of like what we have around us here today. It's about this many people gathering in in an upper room to, to pray and have a prayer meeting. And Luke here, he lists the names of the 11 apostles. They're all very different men, such a diverse group. You've got Simon the Zealot. He, he's the freedom fighter who would have a sword ready to go and, and defeat the Roman guard. And then you've got Matthew who had been working for the Roman guard as a tax collector. And, and now these two are our friends. What unites these crazy people? It's Jesus, right? They, they're putting aside their differences and they're loving Jesus together. And such a diverse group. Same with us, isn't it? It's, it's Christ that unites us. And for once, they're not bickering and fighting. And it's pretty cool. We see them here just praying and waiting. Now, who else are they with? Well, verse 14 says there was a, a, some women there. They were obviously noted as prominent women in this group. The faithful women who had believed and come from Galilee and ministered to Jesus. Probably it's some of them. And probably it's some of the apostles' wives as well. And they were also there waiting for the Holy Spirit. And look who else is waiting. It says Mary and Jesus' half-brothers. Now, you remember the half-brothers? They are those who doubted Christ, rejected Christ, didn't want to know Jesus, didn't believe he was the Messiah, even though they grew up with him. But something's changed, the resurrection. And the one who wrote the epistle of James is one of those brothers, as he, the brother of Christ, turned to, from a, a major doubter to a believer at this time. And then let's talk about Mary. She's there. Interesting, isn't it? This is the very last time that Mary's name will be mentioned in the Bible. It's the one and only time in the book of Acts that Mary's name is mentioned. And here's the interesting observation. She is waiting and praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit just like the rest of the believers are. 
waiting for the empowering of the Holy Spirit, just like the rest. She's praying to God the Father, just like everybody else. And she needs God's help and power, just like everybody else. Now, I have great respect and great regard for Mary. God chose her for the most honored task and mission that any human being has ever been given. And so she must have been a remarkable woman entrusted with delivering and raising the Messiah. But Mary was not superhuman. She was not sinless. And she is in this room and nobody, it says in this room, was praying to Mary. Mary was praying to the Father and waiting for the power, just like everybody else. And so Mary needed Jesus to be her savior and she needs the power of the Holy Spirit as much as any disciple. And so let's remember there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ, Jesus. And we don't need to pray to Mary. We can honor her and one day we'll meet her and she'll be just like us, overwhelmed with the grace of God. And we'll say, nice to meet you and let's worship Jesus together. So praise God that we can come directly to the Father through Jesus Christ directly. Now look at verse 14. We've got one more thing to talk about here today, and that is how it says, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. What does it mean to be in that place of one accord and prayer and supplication? It means they were united. It means that they were together and they're, they're thinking, okay, he just said he's going to send the power of the Spirit. I guess we'll wait. Like, it's been two hours. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, is now the time? And they're just waiting. And then, well, I guess it wasn't today. And they come back the next day. It must be today then. And they're just so anticipating. But it didn't happen. And then, is it the next day? No. And there's this time of waiting. And here's a question for you. What was God doing in the waiting time? We'll see. It's 10 days before this promise of the power of the Holy Spirit comes. What was God doing in those 10 days? Why didn't he just send the power of the Holy Spirit immediately when Christ ascended? Huh, that's a good question. Well, God has many purposes in mind, including his timing for the mission at the day of Pentecost, but he's also doing something in their hearts. And here's what we see. There's the call to prayer. Verse 14, they continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. So they're starting to put into practice what they learned from Jesus about how to pray. They need to learn how to pray and they need to actually do it and to draw close to God in prayer and to start doing that together. Secondly, there's a focus on worship over these 10 days. They worshiped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy, Luke says, worshiping him at the end of Luke. That's Luke 28. And there's also the expectancy of faith that's rising up in their heart, the anticipation that God has promised something to us. And, and Lord, we're not telling you what to do. We're just here to wait for what you said you will do. And this anticipation is growing. Faith is growing. And, and yet there's the, the waiting makes that faith grow deeper. And the waiting makes that faith grow stronger. Because, okay, what if he doesn't come again today and, and, and empower us with the Holy Spirit? Do we still believe? Maybe there's something in your life you're waiting on and the Lord has said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to guide you. But you're still waiting. And you're saying, Lord, what's, what's the deal with the waiting? There's always a purpose in a, and a purpose in that. And here's another reason for that purpose. We see here the beauty of unity and harmony and fellowship with the church family, that they were with one accord, very different people, their hearts being knit together, learning to, to unite around the love of Christ. And this variety and diversity is to all the believers and how they will continue in one accord together in this waiting time. In other words, fellowship gets deeper in that waiting time when we open it up and we gather with other believers. Do not forsake the gathering together. Draw near to fellowship and to, to open your heart and your life and say, okay, I, I got some prayers, some needs. Would you pray for me? And build those relationships because God wants to deepen that fellowship in that time of waiting. And so here's that great question. What's the purpose? 
as you're waiting for the Lord? Well, all I can tell you is God has a purpose in the times of waiting. And God is not in a hurry. God is not part of this instant generation where he's like, everything's got to be right now. Everything's got to be immediately uploaded. Everything's got to be immediately seen. No, God is doing something deeper. And sometimes the waiting is exactly what we need. It's a healthy thing because it forces us to slow down, forces us to draw near to the Lord in prayer and in worship. It forces us to spend time in fellowship with other believers and to ask for prayer and then to see other people's needs and pray for them and realize it's not all about us. There's other people here who have needs too. And this waiting helps us become more like Christ. As we learn, it's not all about us. He has a purpose. He has a plan. Lord, I want to listen to you. I want to keep trusting your promises. And I want to keep waiting with an eagerness and a trust. Let's end over in Philippians chapter 3. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. And here's part of our waiting. We're also waiting for the Lord to return, just as he ascended. He's coming back. Every eye will see him. It'll be public. It'll be obvious. It'll be clear. And in the meantime, we're waiting. Verse 3, Philippians 3, verse 20 it says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able to even subdue all things to himself. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day, knowing, Lord, that in the meantime, you have a purpose for us. Lord, help us be faithful. Help us keep waiting with patience. Help us keep trusting and surrendering and becoming more like Christ. And Lord, you have a reason for the things that we're needing to trust you with so that we will deepen our faith and deepen our unity and our trust in you and our fellowship with one another. And so Lord, help us to look forward to that day, to stay on that mission and to shine bright as witnesses in every corner of this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing Jesus face to face. And we know that he is there at the right hand of God. We know that he's praying for us. We know that he's our advocate. And we know that he's coming, but he's also given us his spirit to live that transformed life, to be that bold witness wherever we go. And so, Lord, would you help us? Lord, to bring our hearts before you daily, to spend time with you, to be refreshed in you. And Lord, not to rely on our own power, but to simply obey by relying on your power. And thank you, Lord, that even in the times of waiting, you have a purpose, that you desire us to be in unity, seeking you in prayer and worship, caring for one another. And Lord, maybe there's some here today who are really in a time of painful waiting for something. We just ask you to bring your comfort and your strength we ask you to bring your hope and trust, Lord, expectation of faith that you are going to answer in your time. You are going to work things out, all things together for good. You are, Lord, not going to leave us or forsake us. In fact, you're here with us. And so would you help us to keep trusting, believing, and drawing closer to you and deeper in fellowship with one another. And Lord, rebuke the enemy who wants to separate us and isolate us and deceive us and pull us away. Rebuke him. Set him back from every single believer, every person in our church family. And help us, Lord, walk by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.